Out of 32 SR-71s built, none were ever shot down from enemy fire. However, 12 were lost due to accidents. Flying at altitudes of over 80,000 feet and at speeds of around Mach 3.2, most accidents were attributed to either the engines failing or the systems that controlled the engines not being really up to par. They were very crude at the time. Accidents due to pilot error were almost unheard of. Besides flying the plane, the pilot was kept very busy just monitoring the engine's performance. The systems that monitored and controlled the inlet air spikes or the air bypass doors just were not reliable enough to fully trust. Often the pilot would have to manually override some of these systems to prevent a condition called an inlet unstart. Basically, if the air is not entering one of the engines correctly, the engine will just shut down, causing the other engine to also shut down. The reason for this is because the engines are so far apart. If you have one engine that's dead, the other one giving 100% thrust, the plane would turn violently into that dead engine. The unstart condition wasn't exactly a rarity either. Pilots would expect to have an unstart at least once or twice for every mission. In most cases, the pilot would simply reset the automatic controls and resume flying again. An unstart was bad enough when you're flying straight and level, but if you're in a banking turn and you had an unstart at that time, the plane could lose control and start breaking up. So therefore, there were times they needed to bail out. So in this video, we're going to discuss how they bailed out at high altitudes and very high speeds. The space-like pressure suit is similar to those worn by the astronauts. It consists of an inner garment of pressure vessels and an outer protective suit with built-in attachment for chute harness, life support connections, a helmet, gloves, and boots. Developed for the role of the very high and very fast environment of the SR-71, the suit provides protection in the event of a decompression or bailout. The system contains a complete survival kit stowed in the seat cushion. Rather than using some kind of an escape pod or capsule, the flight suit itself, the pressure suit, was their escape pod. The S-1030 pressure suit consisted of six layers, including long underwear, comfort liner, ventilation layer, double-walled gas container, restraint layer, and a FIPRO fabric exterior cover. Even though this pressure suit design is over 40 years old, a very similar design is still being used by U-2 pilots today. Surprising to me, the development of full pressure suits have been going on since the 1930s. At this time, aircraft could only reach about 40,000 feet in elevation. These early designs look like they'd be better suited for deep sea diving than being used in an aircraft. Some of these suits look like they're straight from a 1950s Hollywood sci-fi movie. But they all use the same principle, and that is to create an artificial atmosphere inside the suit. All these suits use between 2 and 4 psi of pure oxygen to pressurize the suit. As innovation progressed, the suits became more flexible, more ergonomic, visibility got better, comfort became better, and getting in and out of the pressure suit became less labor intensive. The SR-71 used the SR-1 ejection seat. This was developed by Lockheed. Ejections could be accomplished at any speed and any altitude from the plane just sitting on the ground all the way up to beyond Mach 3 at over 80,000 feet in elevation. The seat contained emergency oxygen for the crew member, sequencers, actuators, solenoid valves, and other little things we'll talk about in a minute. But all these things had to work perfectly if the crew member was to survive an ejection. The ejection sequence was initiated when the crew member tugged on the yellow D-ring located between his knees. Both crew members, the pilot and the RSO sitting in the back seat, had to pull their own D-rings. They were not interconnected in any way. The following sequences all happen in a split second. Immediately the suit pressurizes, the seat harness tensions, and the crew member's legs are pulled tightly against the ejection seat with cables. Just three tenths of a second after the D-ring was pulled, the canopy is ejected. High pressure gas pushes the ejection seat up, then immediately the rocket engines begin to burn. The rocket engine burns for only half a second, but propels the ejection seat 300 feet above the aircraft. 
At the same time the seat leaves the cockpit, a small drogue chute is deployed to help stabilize the seat and prevent it from tumbling around. After 10 seconds, the lower lanyard attached to the bottom of the seat is cut. And I should mention the time it takes for the crew member to go from Mach 3.2 to terminal velocity is about 50 seconds. Now you may think that ejecting at Mach 3.2 at 80,000 feet, the wind blast would just tear the crew member apart. But because the air is so thin at that altitude, ejecting at that speed is equivalent to ejecting at 175 knots at sea level. In fact, wind blasts and deceleration effects at these velocities were relatively low and aerodynamic heating of the pilot during the ejection was not a serious problem. The pressure suit and helmet was all they needed to protect them from this harsh environment, as well as the steady supply of oxygen from the seat. The crew member remained strapped to the seat all the way down to 15,000 feet, which took about seven minutes. At this altitude, the drogue chute is cut away in preparation for seat separation. The crew member is now at an elevation low enough that he could actually breathe outside air. The SR-1 ejection seat used an extraction gun shown here, which fired off a metal slug which dragged the entire main parachute into the airstream to quickly deploy it. At the same time, the seat harness and the metal cables connected to his boots are severed allowing the seat to separate. Once the crew member initiated the ejection, everything was automated. The possibility of being knocked out or injured during that high G ejection was a real possibility at any altitude and speed. When you have a very advanced jet like the SR-71, you also need a very advanced way of getting out of the thing when things go wrong. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know if you like this kind of content or not, and I'll do more of it. Thanks for watching.